Hello, my name is Tammy Freeman and I'm an online editor at Physics World. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Clinical Experience on an Automated QA Platform in a Busy Multicenter Department. The webinar will be presented by Evie Bosset, a medical physicist at Iridium Canker Network in Belgium. In this webinar, Evie will share her and the team's experiences, including details of automation and transit dosimetry, error detection and clinical insights into possible actions for adaptive planning. Evie welcomes your questions, so please do send them in at any time during the webinar. She'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Any unanswered questions will be answered by email once the webinar is over. So just before we start, um, we've got a couple of poll questions for you to answer. So if we can launch the first poll now, please. Okay, so if all of the listeners could select one of the answers there, please. Okay, that's great. So hopefully everyone has answered that now. Um, we have a, a second poll question for you. Oh, okay, they go, they're sharing the answers to the first one. So most people have replied all of the above as to which patient QA steps are the most important. Super, if we can have the second poll now. Okay, just a few more seconds for people to fill in their answers here. That's great. So maybe we can take a look at the results of the second poll. Okay, so which barriers present your department from implementing an EV in vivo monitoring program with SunCheck? And most people have answered time and resources for implementation. Super, so thanks everyone for taking part in that. And now for the, the main presentation, I will hand over to Evie. Okay, thank you. I hope that everybody can uh, hear me. Um, I'm gonna talk about our clinical experience with, uh, with SunCheck in a busy, department. I'm working in um, Antwerp in uh, Belgium and we have uh, four sites. You see some pictures here. Uh, in total we have uh, seven true beams, three Kleenex and about 5,600 new patients a year. So efficiency, standardization and automation are uh, key for a good QC program. Uh, we installed StunCheck in 2017 and uh, we gradually um, increased the patients and the machines uh, which we were working with. And since February 2018, the software is now used on all 10 machines for all patients. Just some uh, small uh, talk about the Chantec platform. So it's a web-based platform from Sun Nuclear and uh, all DICOM data uh, is uh, pushed to the server and all images and log files are then automatically and actively retrieved. And calculation and analysis occur automatically in the background. And so you get automated results and alerts. Uh, the platform consists out of two modules, the SunCheck machine module, 
with SNC routine and SNC me machine and the SunCheck patient module with plan check, dose check and perfraction. Uh, let's talk uh, first a little bit about SunCheck machine and SunCheck routine. Um, the SNC, in SNC routine, you can create uh, QA templates with SNC machine tasks and with self-developed tasks. The standard tasks in the program um, mostly use integrated images for analysis. The images are retrieved and analyzed automatically. This automatic analysis is, of course, time-saving, but what's for us most important is that it is an objective analysis because we are a large center with a lot of physicists performing these tasks. For instance, this is a star shot test and it is possible to set a warning and a failure tolerance levels. And you can also make self-developed task, tasks. In these tasks, you can add parameters with uh, the expected value and some tolerance levels, or um, you can add a parameter with a, with a pass-fail check. Then um, at the home page, there is a clear overview of the QA tasks. Uh, uh, they are can be due or pending review, so due or pending review or approved. And we have made different templates. For instance, the QC field template in our department consists of the SNC machine task, field size, flatness and uh, symmetry. And we have this task, this task for different field sizes and for different energies. For instance, for this, uh, for this machine, we have warnings for all the tasks and we can take a closer look in the imaging workspace. And uh, we can see that uh, Y1 uh, jaw is uh, deviating. Another nice feature of SNC routine is the machine trending. It's possible to trend multiple machines. Here we are looking at the star shot and we can see that one machine is uh, deviating from the other ones and it's uh, almost out of specifications. Then uh, we will go on with the other modules and check patients. Um, that's the main part of my talk. Uh, first, the pretreatment QA, or the so-called fraction zero. The pretreatment QA, uh, we do this for with the EPID images for all VMAT plants, and uh, it takes about five to ten minutes per patient, including preparation, measurement, and verification. So that's very fast. All images are automatically retrieved, calculated, and analyzed with a global gamma analysis of 3% to millimeter, a low dose threshold of 10%, and a passing tolerance level of 98%. If this automatic analysis is failing, then we check the plan and um, we analyze the results uh, with 3% 3 millimeter or 4% 2 millimeter, see what this gives, and uh, if there are no other uh, problems with the plan and we see that it was a difficult plan or something, then we can accept this. If it's uh, still failing with these parameters, uh, results are discussed with a physician. Uh, this is for, and then uh, these are the results. Um, so you can see that 88% of plans pass with automatic analysis and another 8% uh, passes after a detailed check by the physicists and with a 3% 3 millimeter or 4% 2 millimeter analysis. We did notice a difference between the true beam and the Kleenex. True beam shows uh, clearly better results than Kleenex, more than 96% passing rate with the 3% 2 millimeter analysis compared to only 77% uh, for the Kleenex. Causes for this are mostly some technical problems with machines and imagers, but still we see the more complex plants having clearly better results at true beams. Where at uh, Kleenex, about 1% of plants are adjusted in true beams. So far, this never happened. Um, here you can see an example of one of the few cases in which the plan was adjusted. The results showed more than 5% overdosage in large parts of the fields. This was a highly modulated plan of an upper leg where the PTV reached the skin. And uh, we finally made an IMRT plan for this instead of a rapid arc plan uh, to be able to better optimize the skin flash. 
Then let's go to the results of our transit in vivo dosimetry, fraction n. Um, log files are automatically analyzed for all fractions, but no relevant errors were detected with this, but all information of the log files was calculated on the original CT. So the CBCT information is not yet used in routine because it creates too many false positive results due to the bad quality of the CBCTs and some, some software issues. The CBCT information was used, however, in some cases to better evaluate deviating 2D measurements. We take transit EPID integrated images the first three days of treatment and then weekly thereafter. And we did the first analysis after the first year, so in August uh, 2018. And at that time, the software could only uh, do relative analysis, so uh, predicted dose analysis was not yet introduced, so we only could compare to the baseline, and the baseline was uh the first fraction or if this was a uh, bad fraction then it could al also be one of uh, the second or the third fraction and then we did a second analysis uh, from the data between september 18 and august 19 after we introduced absolute analysis so comparing to a predicted dose in total we analyzed uh more than 56,000 fractions of which 91 percent passed and um, of these 56%, 56,000 fractions, um, about 24,000 received uh, EPID measurements, so 43% of cases, and here uh, of 84% pasts uh, of, of these uh, measurements. Then this is the, are the results from the first year, so the relative analysis. Um, we did have, uh, for the failed fractions, quite a lot of false positives. So 41% were false positives, mostly due to dispositioning of the imager, uh, 31%, and to incomplete accumulation of those in the image, 8%. But still, we had 59% patient-related issues, of which 40% patient positioning and 19% anatomy changes. Uh, anatomy changes could be weight loss, deviations in bladder or rectal filling, shrinkage of the tumor, and so on. Uh, for the false positives, we created a report in, uh, in ARIA that helped detecting these. And then in the second year, we went to um, the absolute comparison. And uh, again, we still had 40% of false positives, but 29% of them were on Kleenex and only 11% on true beams. And uh, so also here, the difference. And then 60% uh, uh, patient-related issues, patient positioning, 14% on Kleenex and 17 on true beam, and anatomy changes, 16 on Kleenex and 11% on true beam. When we look into more detail uh, for the second year and we really make a distinction between the patients on through beams and on Kleenex, you see even 50% uh, of false positives for Kleenex compared to only 19% for true beams. The false positives are due to dispositioning of the imager, 7% uh, for Kleenex and 5% for true beam. You see that's a lot less than the first year, but that's because um, we now compare to baseline and uh, we now compare to predicted dose and not to baseline. So the position of the imager is, uh, yeah, there is um, less shifting of the imager needed, and so uh, people don't forget it so much. Then um, technical machine or imager problems are 27% for Kleenex and only 3% for TrueBeam. And imager calibration problems, 12% for Kleenex and 6% for TrueBeam. But uh, let's go to the interesting part. That's the patient-related uh, uh, issues. You see this is uh, the causes for the failed fractions divided per treatment site and technique and you see in our department the largest number of positioning issues arise with the extremities here 12 percent with the boost breasts uh, 10 percent 
and with the esophagus 9% and the head and neck patients also 9%. And the neck patients 9%, positioning patients. Therefore, we decided to apply extra imaging for boost breasts. Um, we decided to give extra attention to proper positioning of the shoulders and to avoiding them more during planning for the head and neck. And the largest number of anatomy changes are seen for pelvis, 10%, for rectum, 10%, pelvis, rectum, 10%, and uh, for abdomen, 9%. Uh, we do have to take into account that it's possible that some of these regions have a lower sensitivity to patient position, so that, uh, but also the anatomy changes is, is uh, due to air in the rectum and so on in these patients. Um, but in anatom anatomical regions with few density differences, like the abdominal regions, a shift in patient's position will have less effect on the transmitted radiation than, for instance, in head and neck regions. Our actions for failed fractions in the, are mostly taken as uh, repeating the image, uh, the measurement, sometimes taking extra care in positioning, like the, the breathing or the, the breath hold, uh, like the shoulder or the arm position, 57% uh, of cases. Then adding extra imaging, like cone beam CT, to get more information. That's often one of the first actions uh, after repeating the measurement, and it's still not fine. And then 23% uh, of cases, no extra actions were taken, for instance, because uh, we found it acceptable for palliative cases or because we were already in the last fractions of treatment. And in 1% of cases, new plans were made on a new CT in the first year. And then in the second year, the actions were quite comparable and we, we did see an increase from 1% to 4% uh, for plan adjustment. So this is also showing the increased confidence in the system as a base for adaptive planning. Then um, I would like to show you some examples of what the software can detect. Uh, first, some of the most occurring problems. Uh, this is breast position. So here you see on the left, the delivered image, and on the right, the expected image. In the middle, a gamma analysis with the parameters uh, you choose. Um, and you see here, you see there is a difference in, if you, if you go look then into uh, offline review, because you can also see the images there and you can match them, um, then you see there is a bad position of the thoracic wall and um, you see it's more than one centimeter here where we would shift it. And then the action for this kind of things is uh, to take setup images again the next day because we don't do daily imaging, we don't do the daily treatment imaging. Um, and uh, if there is again a deviation, then we do uh, three days of imaging to create a better standard position. So we often see this that in the first fractions we do uh, imaging and uh, position, uh, the patient is, is having a good standard position and then after a while he starts to relax more or something or the breathing uh, is different and then uh, we see after a few fractions that we have to, uh, to, um, to look for a better standard position. Then another thing that is happening sometimes is the shoulder position uh, in head and necks. Uh, here you see um, some that the delivered dose is higher than expected dose here. And when we then take, when we have a comb beam CT, you see the shoulder is, uh, is more down and they are not well positioned in the mask. Um, so this does create a risk for overdosage of the milium, myelin. And in this case, it was a heavy weight patient with a small mask, uh, without the shoulders in the mask. And the, ex the action here was to put some extra indications on the mask plate to reproduce the height of the shoulders. And that, that worked really well. Then some other common problem we often see is air in the rectum. You can see it in the Combium CT. After a failed fraction, you see that the del delivered dose, exit dose is higher than the than expected. 
and the action here is to instruct the patient for better bowel preparation and maybe some diet information. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Then here, weight loss is of course something we can this easily detect with uh, with this software, and uh, the action here is of course to put a new plan on a new CT. Tumor reduction is also something uh, you can uh, see quite well. This is the first CBCT, and this is a CBCT after only six fractions. We saw a high uh, tumor reduction, and we already put a new plan on a new CT after six, only six fractions. And then this is another case of tumor reduction uh, combined with a bit of weight loss. Uh, at, this is a, an esophagus, and at first sight, you would not see that much of a difference in the CBCT, but when we actually did take a new CT and we put a new plan on it, we saw that we had an overdosage of 116% and the original plan was only 106%. And also in the DVHs, you could see a quite uh, um, high shift in uh, myelin dose and of course also in PTV dose, but that's le less of an issue. So I think if this patient would have gone further with the original plan, um, that we may would we would maybe create a, a problem on the myelin if the patient would uh, start using more and more weight and more tumor reduction. This is a case where a patient had a pneumonia. That's a less occurring problem. Um, in this case, less dose was indicated by perfraction. And this was the, the CT on which was planned. This was the first CBCT. And then in the 12th fraction, uh, we start to see uh, the deviation and we took a new CBCT and we we saw some uh, density here in the lungs. Uh, the patient also didn't feel well and um, turned out that he had a pneumonia so the action here was treatment with antibiotics and uh, in later fractions uh, the perfraction improved again and also the, the CBCT uh, improved and you see also that the perfraction improves. Um, now, this is something uh, we saw. This was uh, an arm in the lateral field. So here is your expected dose. Here is your delivered dose. You clearly see uh, an underdosage here. And this was a patient which were, who was simulated with the arms down. So there was an arm visible in the DRR. But the plan in the plan, it was planned with, out the, with the arms out of the body. And uh, it was forgotten to put an extra note in the patient file that the patient had to put the arms up. Um, so we could clearly see it in uh, in perfection and uh, we could inform the the, uh, the nurses that uh, that the arms should be up and uh, we noted an extra note in the patient file. This was a uh, actually a CT with uh, artifacts, but uh, it was a very slow breathing and it induced uh, ar the artifacts um, in the CT, but it remained unnoticed, however, that these artifacts actually masked the very large mu movement of the tumor. So um, the, the tumor was not moving in this part, but it was actually moving all the way down to here, and this was this was not seen in um, in the original CT, but perfraction indicated uh, uh, a deviation, and uh, the action here was a new plan with a larger RTV and a larger PTV. Then um, we still don't know how this could happen, but. Um, we saw a very large deviation in perfraction, and then we looked at the uh, at online match. The, the 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 photos were were the were fine. The the KV images there was a as a correct match, but then we noticed that after the online match, the table shift was apparently not applied for some reason. 
so um, this uh, fraction was uh, uh, completely well like you see uh, more than seven centimeters off so the action here was an extra fraction with the new plan compensating for the missed part And then uh, finally, uh, we, we discovered a problem with our belly boards that was already there for years. Um, there was apparently a systematic difference between the belly board of the SIM and some of our machines. So we had a patient here with uh, some uh, deviation in perfection. And then when you take a comb beam CT, you see the belly is not correctly positioned in the opening. So you tell the nurses to better position the patient, but they say, well, we, we follow the marks that are on the belly board. So, uh, and we saw this with a lot of patients. So we started to think what could be wrong here. And then we actually put all of our belly boards from the machines and from the simulator and we put them next to each other. And we saw that these white position indicators on the sides where, where we position our patients on, that these uh, were not at the same height relative to the opening in the different uh, belly boards. And in some cases, this, this differed like five, five, four, five centimeters. So this caused uh, the problem that, that the belly was not in the correct uh, place in the opening. So to conclude, um, I want to say that the standardized transit dosimetry program was introduced in a busy department and that the system allows for efficient QA for all patients and all for even all fractions if you wanted to. Um, the web-based platform makes all QA centered in one place. The SunCheck machine saves time and delivers a user-independent analysis. The pretreatment QA with perfection only takes five to 10 minutes a per patient, everything included. And the in vivo transit dosimetry uh, efficiently reveals a wide variety of deviations and, and the absolute verification enhances the detectable errors. We believe in vivo based on log files only is not sufficient for patient QA, especially if it's not combined with the CBCT images. And we also see that in vivo transit dosimetry shows potential to serve as a base for adaptive planning. If you want more, more information, here is my email address. Thank you. Well, that's great. Um, thank you, Evie, for a great presentation. So now we've got some time to take a look at some of the questions that have been sent in. Mm -hmm. And if any of the audience have got any questions they'd still like to ask, please do send them in to us. So we will start off. Um, for your pretreatment QA, is this done with a phantom or with nothing in place? With nothing in place, so it's just uh, like you would do the the variant. So it's just putting the imager at uh, zero and uh, giving the plan. Okay. Um. Do you treat prone breast? No, it's not prone. Okay. It's fine. Do you have a um, bladder and rectal filling prep yes. protocol for your yes. prostate patients? Yes, we do. Um, but still, some patients have seem to have problems, and yeah. Okay. Um, who checks the failed fractions, and how do you decide what action to take if a measurement is out of tolerance? Well, we have a decision tree for everybody to use and the failed fractions are checked daily by the responsible physicists and physicians. The physicists mostly check the failed fractions for false positives like imager and machine problems and then the physicians decide on the actions for the clinical issues. So they, or we look at the images in offline review and then uh, if there is a positioning error, like uh, also shoulders or swallowing is sometimes an issue, then we take some new images uh, or with a new, with a new CBCT and we take a new measurement. Uh, and then later on we decide if, if maybe daily images are necessary for this patient or if we need a new standard position. 
Um, and then, but if the positioning is okay, then, and there is no CBCT available, then the first action is of course to take a, a CBCT so we can we can look what's the problem and then uh, if a CBCT is available then we check for weight loss or gain for bladder or rectum filling for tumor regression or increase and or for infection or something like that and then uh, we can decide if we we have to take a new CT with a new plan or give some diet or other instructions or some medication Okay, thanks. Um, what's the gamma criteria for log file based QA? Um, for but yeah, for log file based QA, it's um, let's see, um, it's the, all our all our tolerances are actually um, depending on um, what type of. Uh, uh, irradiation it is. So we have other parameters for breasts or for head and neck or for rectum. Um, for the log file analysis, I don't have the numbers here. Uh, I think the most is also 5%, 5 millimeter and a 95% um, passing tolerance level. Okay. Um, how well is the Sun Nuclear model fitting to your data and how does it affect your results? You mean the machine model or? Um, sorry, it just says how, how well is the Sun Nuclear model fit, fit to your data? If that's not clear, you can, you can follow this up afterwards if, if that's easier. Yeah, maybe because I don't understand. Uh, we we did have. Uh, is it's not the the, the machine model uh, that you mean? Um, well, we'd have to contact the person that asked the question. Yeah, maybe They're still on the line and they want to elaborate. That would be great. Otherwise, um, I will move on to the next question. Um, this is quite a broad one. What are the causes of false positives? Well, I showed, well, let's go back. Uh, the causes of the false positives are uh, 3D log file problems, sometimes a little bit 2%. Well, uh, I don't have an uh, imager problems, uh, beam interruptions, Software or log file problems uh, here. So technical machine or imager problems, imager position, uh, the imager calibration, and sometimes software problem imperfection or 3D log file problem. Okay. Um, how would you like to move forward with transit dosimetry and adaptive planning? Well, um, for the moment, we are um, doing a study only for the head and neck patients because there we have a, a large number of uh, data for um, with evaluation CTs. So until recently, we always took an evaluation CT halfway uh, the treatment, and um, we can we can now see in how many cases a uh, patient needed replanning, and that perfection didn't show uh, a failure, and also the other way around in how many times the patient uh, the perfection showed a failure, but no uh, replanning was needed, and then we can go on from there and see how sensitive the software is uh, for uh, for the adaptive planning, for the need for adaptive planning. Maybe we can uh, adjust our para our tolerances a little bit uh, to get a better um, to make it better. Um, so yeah, this is also uh, some work in progress now, and maybe we can we can uh, do it also for other treatment sites later. Okay. Um, how often do you do Clinac Imager calibration? 
We normally do it after our um, absolute uh, calibration, so uh, six, weeksly, six weekly normally. And for, for the true beams, that's more than enough. Um, it could even go for months without recalibrating. But for the Kleenex, it's strange. Sometimes in some Kleenex, we often have periods that we have to recalibrate every, weekly, every week. Uh, but uh, sometimes it can can go on for the six week period, so it's a bit strange. <laughs> okay, um, why why do you think the results for fraction zero are better for true beams than for Clinax? Well, um, I, the causes are mostly technical problems with the machines and the imagers, as the imager position of the imagers on the Kleenex is not corrected mechanically during VMAT and hence less stable than the imagers on the true beams. Um, and in addition, the more complex plants show better results at true beams. It's known from log file analysis that true beam MLC positioning errors are substantially lower than those of Kleenex. Okay, um, next question is, how do you decide the gamma criteria for in vivo transit dosimetry? How do we decide the gamma criteria? Well, our tolerances that we use um, are empirically determined and we tried to balance the rate of false positive errors, which are increasing the workload to the false negative errors um, when we fail to detect the clinically relevant discrepancies. And the tolerances are depending on the treatment site because the treatment site largely determines what type of immobilization is used and which treatment techniques and what acceptable tolerances are. For instance, our head and neck is analyzed with a 3% 3 millimeter, while the palliative treatments are analyzed with 7% 5 millimeter. Um, we we want to use some kind of, I call it an Amara principle. Uh, we want to detect as many errors as reasonably achievable. And um, yeah, for the moment, there's a manuscript being reviewed for publication in FIRO explaining this principle and also giving an overview of the use tolerances and why and how did, how do we, did we come to them. So maybe look for, uh, look, uh, go look to that uh, in, in a few weeks or months. Yeah. Okay, uh, the, another question is, are the gamma criteria relative or absolute? You mean local or global? That no. is all the question says, the gap, it just says, <laughs> are the gamma criteria relative or absolute? Um, well, we use uh, Global normalization for if if this is the, if this is the question we use a global normalization for all VMAT plants and um, local normalization for uh, the 3D and the palliative uh, and the breasts um, uh, because um, well we don't think that. Uh, a global, a local analysis is, um, yeah, is good for um, the VMAT because let's go to my. Um, where is it? Um, It's known that global analysis masks some problems, but also that local analysis magnifies some irrelevant errors at low doses. Mm -hmm. And since integrated images for VMAT plants consists of, of a summation of those for all angles, they are uh, less sensitive to geometric errors anyhow, and local analysis only seems to magnify irrelevant errors for large VMAT plants. Okay, now somebody has asked, would you be willing to share the decision tree? Yes, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can, but I already <laughs> told told uh, the most uh, most of it. Uh, but we do have 
well, two decision series. We have one for the physicists to analyze, uh, yeah, like how do we come to the false positives? How do we check the false positives? And then we have one for the physicians uh, that I explained. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in pretreatment QA, when there is an error, is it mostly due to LINAC or the TPS? And how do you distinguish between TPS and LINAC errors? Um, you mean for, wait. Like, which of the errors mostly due? Is it mostly due to LINAC or the TPS? Mostly due to LINAC. Um, like I said, the the imagers are less stable, um, and the MLCs uh, may not. Well, it's 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 actually both. It's it's mostly imagers because the imagers are are a bit less stable mechanically, of course. So that that induces the the fact that we have to go more to a three percent three millimeter analysis. Um, but uh, but also when you have made difficult plans, so with with uh, yeah large MLC movements or something like that, sometimes um, the clinic cannot follow. I think, but that's only in 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 one percent of cases. I think, uh, and sometimes when we do have some really difficult plans, then um, it's it's only like a few percent uh, that we have uh, more dose or less dose and then the, the physician says well it's okay for this patient this is acceptable okay um is it possible to include results of third party equipment um map check art check just for statistics or, or do you need to do do that out of this system um well, I think, but I think that maybe somebody from Sun Nuclear can answer. But um, you can do the arc check measurements, but it's for the moment, I think, not fully included in the software yet, but it's due for one of the next releases, I think. So that it's then really integrated also in this Sun Check software. Okay. Uh, how many incidents do you have to check each day? Well, uh, with 5,600 patients a year, how many incidents a day? Um, <laughs> um, I think uh, some, I think it's about two or three per machine per day. So with 10 machines, I think it's about 30. Okay. 20, 20 to 30, but also including the false positives. And these are very uh, fast, uh, um, decide, well, the imager is at the, uh, the wrong position. So we immediately see that it's at the wrong, the wrong position. And then you say, well, uh, take a new measurement. So that's really fast. Uh, the patients we really have to look into uh, with problems, uh, then then I think a few patients a day we have to order and uh, that that the positioning is is not okay, so that uh, they have to take new images. I think that's about one patient per day per machine maybe, and then and then and I think uh, it's like two patients or three patients per day for all machines then are sometimes having some other issues like uh, like anatomy changes or something. But okay. sometimes we also follow up it follow it up for a few days. So then it comes back the next day with a new failure. Okay, um, somebody has asked, can you please share your experience of how SNC machine handles CBCT image quality, particularly low contrast resolution and slice thickness? Well, um, I have to say um, the part of SunCheck machine is not my cup of tea, so I use it, but I do not have for the moment here all 
knowledge about it. So please uh, give that uh, that question through email, and I will give it to my colleague who uh, who does everything with SNC machine. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um. Right. I think we've got an update on on the question we weren't sure about earlier about how well does yeah. the Sun Nuclear model. So. Um, the, the, that was referring to the beam model provided by um, SNC. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did uh, let them adjust the beam model a little bit. So it was uh, it was a bit off, but uh, it was only yeah some MLC parameters that I did have to change a little bit. Uh, but we did expect well for for the Kleenex model, the true beam model was actually quite nice uh, but we did also change it a little bit but this, that was only uh, a small deviation but we did uh, uh, let it adjust a little bit by sun nuclear the, the cleanac was more off but uh, that was expected because we know we did adjust our mlc parameters on the machine quite a lot in the beginning uh, deviating from the golden beam data Okay. Um, and for we have, um, I also have to say that for we have one uh, STX, one true beam STX, and um, also we there we um, we made a new model in uh, in Ray Station. So all our other machines are uh, in Eclipse, but uh, the STX is in a Ray Station. So we made a new model for that in Ray Station. So we also send uh, sent our data. To uh, Sun Nuclear to uh, to let um, change the model a little bit, but they did send us back that something was wrong um, with our output factors uh, that they were deviating more than normal, and uh, it turned out that our output factors for the small uh, for the small fields um, were deviating because the the jaw one of the jaws was a little bit off during the measurement of the output factors, so that introduced uh, actually quite a deviation on the on the output factors. But they did see it in our uh, our data when when we send it to them to change the model. So I think it's actually yeah it's it's a good check for your machines uh, if you send all your data to Sun Nuclear and, and let them uh, investigate and, and change the model a little bit. But we did have to wait quite a long time for the adjusted B models, I have to say that. Um, somebody has asked, what is the 3D log file problem? Um, well, that's um, mostly caused a little bit by Varian, but also by Sun Nuclear. That is when a beam is interrupted, then it creates a log file or, or a double log file or a half a log file, I don't know. And then um, Sun Nuclear cannot combine these uh, log files or it only reads part of the log files and then uh, you get a so-called yeah deviation in those, but but it's actually because the log, log files are not complete because there was a beam interrupt. Okay. For the inter integrated images, that's not a problem. Uh, also, even not for the for the Kleenex, it makes different integrated. Uh, well, for the Kleenex, it does create a problem sometimes because that's uh, what I call, that's the problem that I called, um, where is it? Uh, here, the incomplete accumulation of those in the image, that's mostly caused uh, on, on Kleenex because when uh, you have a beam interrupt, it creates your integrated image. And then when you go on with the treatment, it doesn't make a new integrated image. So it's like only part of the dose has been given in the image. Um, but on true beams, uh, it creates a second integrated image. And uh, that's not a problem in perfection because it uh, adds automatically the two integrated images. OK. Um... Are the passing criteria only based on the gamma passing rate, or can you make other? Can you include other parameters to make the decision to accept it? 
you can you can uh, choose a lot of uh, other parameters. Uh, well, maybe I'll have to. You can still see my screen, right? Yeah. Mm, well, I'll show it to you in a minute. Maybe I don't have to share my patient information. Here you have you see um, the metrics you can use, and then um, if you, I hope it's working because this is a, a rather slow computer for perfection. So you, you can see there is a custom metrics templates, um, and but these are our, uh, our templates that we created. There is also a universal metric templates, but uh, I think it's not working. <laughs> I chose the wrong computer for doing this. <laughs> But I chose a computer that is in a in a really nice quiet room, but <laughs> but basically you can yes, you can include other parameters. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um are there what kind of problems are there that log file based QA cannot detect the error? Come again? Um are, are there problems? Um, that log file based QA can't detect? What sort of problems can't be detected by this? Well, if you don't use the Combeam CT, not any patient problem will be detected. That's that's why we don't use it. Uh, we don't uh, believe in the log file analysis. It can only detect uh, problems with your machines if you don't include CBCT data. And the calculation on the CBCT data is very difficult. Um, these Combeam CTs are often of, of bad quality. Uh, if you have to take Combeam CTs for every patient, then it takes a lot of time. Uh, often it's, sometimes it's also not possible to take Combeam CTs for some patients. Um, so, um, we don't believe in this. We 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 see a lot of patient-related problems, and you just can't see them with uh, with log file analysis. So now I've got my parameters. So in uh, general settings, you have a pointos that you can uh, choose, and then for the 2D analysis, there's difference in fraction zero and fraction n. So can, you can use different methods, difference, composite evaluation, gamma, gradient, comp, uh, compensation, and difference to DTA. You can choose global or local, and then the different tolerances and thresholds. Okay, great. Um, we've just had a message through a little note from Sun Nuclear. Um, referring back to uh, something you mentioned earlier, just to say that the ARC check integration is included in SunCheck version three. Yeah. So just yeah. just passing okay. passing that information on. Yeah, that's all. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, next question: Do you still use the measurement based QA or only per fraction for QA? Only per fraction QA. Okay. Um, and well, if if it, if there is really it it was in some cases, but I I think maybe maybe twice or or in three or two or three cases in the last years, um, we had a deviation in fraction zero that we could not decide if it if it was real or what was the problem, and then we did some other measurements with phantoms just to check it. 
Um, Okay, and, and sort of similar line, in cases of SRS or SBRT, oh. results are good. Um, did you check using phantom or iron chamber again? Um, yes, um, we did some measurements and we did see for, for our SRS for very small fields that um, the, comp the 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 calculation in per fraction is uh, is a little bit uh, off for fraction n. Um, I think it has to do with um, um, the the grids, the calculation grids, that it's maybe a little bit too large. Um, I don't know, but we we see for very small fields in uh, in fraction n, we see the deviation. Not so much for fraction zero, it's worse than fraction n. Okay, um, so the values for the gamma criteria approval, is this the same for all anatomic regions? No, that's what I, I said we have. Um, we let our gamma criteria um, depend on um, the PTV margin, so for uh, head and neck it's 3 millimeter, uh, and for brain also, and then for breast it's, it's 6 millimeter. For most other regions it's 5 millimeter. And then for percentage, um, we use uh, mostly 5%, but also again for head and neck uh, we use 3%. And for um, uh, palliative treatments and for breasts we use uh, seven percent and also for whole brain radiotherapy and um, that's because um, with this skin flash uh, when there is a small deviation uh, in in uh, in positioning it's um, it's uh, that's and uh, and also a 90 percent tolerance level for the whole brain radiotherapy and for breasts because we have when you have a, a small shift then uh, due to the skin flash it creates a large number of deviating points uh, and it's still not cl clinically relevant and so we uh, lowered it to a 90 per 90 percent passing tolerance level and uh, the dose difference tolerance uh, we um, yeah, made it higher to seven percent. But uh, yeah, it will be published in a manuscript in Firo how we got our our uh, tolerances. <laughs> so, so I mean, have you assessed that the results that were with tolerance after better positioning or preparation of the patients? I mean, what was the result of the fifty-two percent repeated imaging? <laughs> um, well, uh, we did not, well, it's, how do you assess the results? Um, we did not go really into detail into this analysis. Uh, yeah, it's a great idea, however, for future studies, but we do know for most of the patient, better positioning did the trick if positioning was the cause of error. Um, for the bowel preparation, it was more difficult. Sometimes better instructions worked, but in some cases, a, a good preparation kept being difficult throughout the whole treatment. Um, we did the first analysis for prostate patient, and it's also being submitted now for publication in Firo. So. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> thanks for answering all those questions. We've, we've actually run out of time now. So. Um, Thanks to everyone in the audience who asked a question. And if we didn't get around to answering you, you'll be contacted by email. If anyone would like to watch the webinar again or recommend it to a colleague, it'll soon be available on Physics World. Um, finally, thanks again to Evie. That was fantastic. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. This webinar is now over.